us of the fact that he is king and he's ruling and reigning. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance here by heaven.
graduates. I just want to tell you a quick word. Uh, this uh, graduating class is a class that everybody in this church can be very proud of sending out into the world. Uh, we have 11 seniors here this morning, uh, and these 11 seniors, uh, I'll just be very honest with you. Uh, one of the things that I prayed as, as Courtney and I came to serve at Central Baptist Church, and we realized that, uh, man, Jacksonville is a melting pot of the cultures. It is. That's a good thing. Hallelujah to that. If you don't like that, you ain't going to like heaven too much. Let me just put it to you that way. <laughs> and so one of the things that we prayed for was diversity in our youth ministry. And this is the class of students that saw it happen by obeying God's will and just being Jesus to everyone they came around. So we will be honoring those graduates this morning. And so how we're going to do that is we will be inviting them each on the stage and sharing a brief word about them. We also have a gift for them. Now, I will say this. It is a little bit of an untraditional gift. We're not giving them a Bible this year, and here's why. They've already got God's Word written on their heart and in their hands, so we're not going to give them another one. But what we are going to do is give them what they call a giving key. And it is a necklace with a key that is on it that has a word that I chose for our seniors uh, that we will reveal to you here in a little bit. We're going gonna to have some suspense there. How's that sound? That the, the purpose of this key is that they will look at it, they will wear it, and they will try to live out the message that this word has on the key. When they have come to the point that they feel they have mastered that, that word, that they have mastered that lesson, then their responsibility is to take the necklace off and give it to somebody else. And I think that this senior class will do an excellent job of that. And so first up, we have Joel Crowley. Joel is the son of Bob and Sharon Crowley. His grandparents are Jackie and Ellen Maxwell, and his great-grandparents are Frank and Sarah Goodson. Joel will be attending Letourneau University to study engineering physics. And I will say this from personal experience, he is a genius. So if you need anything done, uh, we had a box full of just random electronic parts. I left him. I uh, didn't even tell him to do anything with it. I came back, and there was a man cave in one of our empty classrooms. So it was incredible. Uh, but Joel, we were so happy to, to have a time to, to have some ministry in Joel's life and his ministry to us. Next up is Kim Cruz. Kim is the daughter of Jorge and Marcia Cruz. 
She plans on t attending Texas A&M University to study a bachelor's in biology, but we will forgive her for that. <laughs> Kim has been a faithful member of our student ministry for about three years now, and she will be sorely missed when she's gone. Next up, we have Dee Dee Hamilton and the parent, the son of Samantha Scott. <laughs> Dee Dee's plans after graduation are attend ETBU, East Texas Baptist University, to play basketball and pursue a degree in youth ministry. And we are happy to be these with us. Next we have Lauren Horton. Lauren, <laughs> Lauren is the daughter of Jeff and Lana Horton. She'll be attending Blinn College to pursue a degree as a paralegal, and Lauren is one of our six-year student ministry students who has been with us since the seventh grade, and so we're going to miss Lauren for sure. <laughs> Next up, we have Miss Deborah Lua. <laughs> Deborah is the daughter of Elizabeth Lua, and one of her favorite uh, memories, uh, well, excuse me, one of her, uh, her college plans are to pursue a degree in nursing like her mother. One of her favorite memories or lessons uh, is going to summer camps with the student ministry in the summertime. And so that's Deborah Lua. <laughs> Next up we have Miriam Mendoza. <laughs> we are almost done with the Mendozas in the youth ministry. We have one left. <laughs> And we're going to miss them when they're gone. But Marion uh, plans on attending Jacksonville College and pursue a career of speech pathology. Marion has been uh, in our youth ministry serving faithfully since the ninth grade, and we are so happy to have had her. <laughs> Next, we have Nina Mitchell. Nina is the daughter of Tamika Mitchell, and she will be attending Stephen F. Austin State University to study fashion merchandising. <laughs> Nina's favorite memory from our youth ministry is our trip that we took this year as a group of seniors and college students to our passion, where we got to worship along with 20,000 other people at the same time in the same house, and it was an awesome experience. Next up, we have Anna Murray. Anna is the daughter of Barry and Lee Ann Murray. She'll be attending TJC in the fall and later work towards a master's degree in elementary education. We need teachers. We need teachers. Next up is Deborah Tatum. Deborah is the son of Yolanda Creighton and Roderick Tatum, and he is one of a I don't know how he he's, he's a triplet, so that's awesome. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we got to say about Deverick there. <laughs> he's plans a, after, uh, after high school or attending Tyler Junior College to finish his basics and play football. <laughs> Next up, we have Abby Trailer. <laughs> Abby is the daughter of Kelly and Amy Trailer. She will be attending Charlton State University to major in animal science. And one of her favorite memories is attending Super Summer, which is our leadership training that she's been eligible for since she entered the youth ministry. Yeah. And last but not least, we have Gio Villarreal. <laughs> Gio is the son of Santiago and Victoria Villarreal. Uh, after college, he plans on attending JBC, and he has been, G's been something else. <laughs> G's, one of his favorite memories is just attending the countless events that he's been on with us, summer camp, super summer, passion, and he has been there every step of the way as an active and faithful member of our youth ministry. And here is our senior class of 2016. <laughs> If you wouldn't mind, if you would please, just as you, uh, I, we're going to ask that you pray for our seniors, but here's what we're going to do. 
since you, not everybody can come up and lay hands on them, and I do believe that is a biblical precedent of the laying of hands in prayer, if you just please put your hands towards the front, towards our seniors as we pray. What I'm going to ask that we do is that if everybody would please pray out loud a prayer over our seniors as they get ready to go into the world, and I will close this whenever the, the, the prayers kind of start to cease. So if you would please do that in three, two, one. My God, I am thankful for the opportunity to have served alongside and with these students. And Lord, they're going to go off and do big things wherever they go. And Lord, we are all better that these students are in the world. Father, your kingdom, Lord, it is better because these students are doing your work faithfully. And so Lord, we want to pray a prayer of protection around them because we know that the devil hates a dynamic Christian. And so as the devil tries to take them from your grip, Lord, I pray that you would hold them even tighter. I pray that wherever university they end up at, Lord, that you would use them as a light in a world that is surrounded by darkness right now. Lord, that they would be the salt of the earth and they would add flavor everywhere they go and that flavor would be Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from a passage that leads into this next song. It is the passage of the woman who was caught in adultery. And as she was brought before Jesus, and as these men who accuse, accuse her come forward, Jesus tells them, you know, he, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And here is the end of that particular story. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she said. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. God, as we continue to worship, God, we are, we are as that woman. We're in sin and we're guilty. God, we're ashamed of what we are. But you have taken that sin on yourself, on your son Jesus. And we praise you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become, these hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. Okay. 
God, how can it be? We're guilty. We know we are. We're ashamed. And yet you pleaded our cause. You, you took and made our wrongs right. You broke those chains for us. You prayed the price. And we praise you for that this morning. Did you know uh, in, the, in the New Testament, uh, as the disciples are leaving the upper room, the, the, when the Last Supper took place to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, that it says, like the gospel writers, they, they thought it was important enough to say that Jesus sung a hymn with his disciples. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It's like, and, and so for me, I don't know, just... I kind of felt compelled to say this in the early service, although I didn't prepare for it, but it's one of those things like where music is such a beautiful way to give praise to Jesus because if Jesus gave praise to himself by singing, I'm pretty sure that you and I need to be giving Jesus praise by singing as well. So, man, thank you all guys for leading us, but man, that clap is to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And that's the name that we're going to lift up this morning. So y'all go ahead, crack open your Bibles to the book of John, all right? John chapter 12. We're going to be in about three or four different passages today. If I really get going, we could move that up to five or six. We might be here all day. We are not going to beat the Methodists to church or to lunch today. <laughs> that joke's on you. John chapter 12. When I was uh, 19 years old, I first got started in ministry as an intern at First Baptist Church of Corsicana, Texas. Uh, God called me there to, I, I believe he called me there to specifically minister to about 45 young men. We started this Bible study called Man Up. And uh, it was like some of my earliest messages, sermons or whatever, and they were so bad. I could not put a coherent word together if my life depended on it. Uh, but here's the thing that, that happened, not just in me, but in also in those young men that gathered, is that the name of Jesus was lifted high. The name of Jesus was lifted high. The name of Kobe was not. The name of all those young men was not. It was the name of Jesus. And in John chapter 12, verse 32, we get this word right here. And I, this is Jesus talking, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Let me read that again so it'll sink in there. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Now, here's the thing about this verse, because uh, guess what the greatest commentary on the Bible is? The Bible, all right? So in verse 33, it says, but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So verse 32 says, and I, if I am lifted up. So here's Jesus on the day that he died. He's face first in the ground with the cross on his back, and they have to lift him up off the earth to put him in the ground, so that way me and you can be freed from our sin, all right? So he's telling us here, he's like, guys, this is the way I'm going to have to go. I've got to die on the cross, and when I do, I'm going to bring everybody to me. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send out an invitation for all. And we also get this kind of cross word in here because it's not only the symbolism of him dying on the cross, but it's also this idea that when you and I lift high the name of Jesus, we don't have to get everything else right. We just got to get that right, and he's going to bring us to him. And he's going to bring people that we would never believe to him. And so if you don't have faith that God can save the sinner that is sitting next to you, guys, we got to get something right in the room. We're going to preach the gospel this morning. The name of Jesus is going to be lifted up. And so, seniors, I want to invite everybody in on a conversation that I'm about to have with you. Because as you see on those keys that you have right there, there's one word. Leave. <laughs> everywhere you are called, seniors, everywhere you're called, you're going to be called to leave. What are you going to leave behind? Because in verse 32 of the book of John, chapter 12, if you leave behind the name of Jesus, he's going to draw everybody to him. If you leave behind you, it's going to push everybody away. Every 
circumstance, every minute of every day, every encounter that you have, when you're going through the line at Subway and you're asking for your Italian herb and cheese, I don't care that word is spelled H-E-R-B, Italian herb and cheese sandwich, you are responsible for that moment that God has put you in to leave behind something that looks more like Christ and less like you. And so we're going to look at three moments in the life of Jesus here on this earth and what he left behind. And I hope that from what he left behind, we will know what we need to leave behind. But all the while, we are going to be proclaiming the gospel. So if you're in the room and you're just like, I don't know about this Jesus character. He's not in my life. You keep t telling me that, you know, that, that I'm dead on the inside and everything else. Well, yes, I do believe that. But I do believe that you're going to have the opportunity this morning to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So tune in with me. And if the other stuff doesn't apply, then just tune in to the story of Jesus that we call the gospel. So in John chapter 19, that's where we're going next. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. This is what it says. Let's read along together. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the Scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, check this out, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. When Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. What do I mean by that? Because for the longest time, I read this passage wrong, okay? Now, if you look right there in verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill Scripture, we also know from Scripture that he had to have that, that branch of sour wine thrust up into his mouth. We know that that had to happen, okay? And so therefore, when it says it is finished for the longest time, I read that as, okay, all the things that had to happen for Jesus to die, it, it happened. And so now all of that is finished. Now he can die, and now we can be saved. But check out what he says here one more time. It says it is finished, and we're about to do a Greek word study, which scares me to death because I don't even know English that well, okay? So it should scare you pretty well too. Throw that word up on the board, all right? One word in the Greek, to telestai, it means it is finished. That is the literal translation. Whenever you see the word to telestai in Scripture, so Jesus is on the cross, he's about to die, he says to telestai, it is finished. And while we have the translation right, we don't have the context right. See, Courtney and I, we went to the University of Mary Harden Bailey, private Christian university. UMHB is the acronym. We changed that to the University of Money Hungry Baptist when we left there because <laughs> they were relentless on those student loans. Well, anyway, we got one of our loans paid off, and it was a party in the Duran household that day. We got one of them paid off, and so they sent us back this, this receipt or this, uh, this thing that basically said that we got all of our debt paid. And at the end of it, or at the top of it, it says, Debt status paid in full. You see, what this tetelestai was, it's, it's kind of this Jesus, it's, it's Jesus trying to give this metaphorical message to his people because tetelestai was stamped on a debt 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth. When you and I had a debt, or if we lived 2,000 years ago and, and we were running around and we owed somebody something and we had this debt, when we paid it off, they would stamp on there, tetelestai, you don't owe anything. It's done. And here is Jesus. He's not just saying it is finished, that all the stuff that had to happen for me to die is finished. He's saying that you and I, the debt that we owe, it is paid in full. The body of believers is the only debt-free culture in the world. You owe somebody money? Who cares, man? Try to get out of it if you can. But, you know, we, we throw paper away all the time. We throw, you use paper to go to the bathroom, okay? Listen, the only thing that's different about that is money is green and it's got a dead president's face on it. I don't know why we freak out about it all the time. You owe money to somebody, that's fine. But listen, when you become a part of the body of believers, you are spiritually set free, debt free from your sin and from your stain. That's a great way to be, guys. Because if you go into the afterlife, if you go into the judgment room with any debt... You don't get heaven. But because Jesus proclaimed something to Telestai, 
It is finished. It is paid in full. You and I have a reason to sing. You and I have a reason to praise. When Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. Where does all this come into it? Because check this out. Jesus didn't have no debt to pay, but he paid ours anyways. What is that? That's sacrifice. The first, the first became second so that all of us who were dead may have life so that way we could praise the first once more. So check this out, y'all. Second, you, if you're listening to my words, you are second. I am second. I had a wonderful conversation with Nick Bruno not too long ago talking about marriage, and I joked, and, do we got any married people? Raise your hand if you're married. Don't be, you better be proud of it, too. We'll get some marriage counseling going on here. <laughs> hey, is marriage hard? I think it's hard. And I asked Nick, I was like, man, why is marriage so hard, Nick? And he said, because everything in you wants to be first, but God has called you to be second. And he said, this is the cool thing about it. When I am second and Mary Sue is second then God gets all the glory He's due. You and I are second. That's who we are. And we have got it so mixed up and messed up all the time talking about how it's about my preference and my way and everything else. No, it's not about me at all. It's about Jesus. It's about how I can serve others so that way the name of Jesus would be exalted so that way He can draw all men to Himself. You're Baptist hymnal right there. If you want to break it open, you can. But I just want you, it's there so you can fact check me if you're thinking, that's a bunch of bull. You, it's in your Baptist the very first page of it. 1609, the Baptist faith or the Baptist denomination was created. A guy by the name of Thomas Helwes and John Smythe uh, broke away from the Church of England, went and planted, I think, in Amsterdam. And it was this awesome body of believers, okay? You had just a group of people who were persecuted in England, and they were like, we believe that believers are the only one that can be baptized. It's not for babies, but it's for believers. We believe uh, that, that uh, the priesthood of the believers, that everybody can come before the throne room of God. You don't have to go through the Pope or through a priest or something like that. And they just listed out these lists of things that they believe that are ordained by Scripture, and they started praising Jesus, y'all. This is how their church services would go, all right? The first guy, John Smythe, he would stand up and he would say, this is a word from the God, and he, and he would just start reading from the Scripture. He would sit down. Somebody else would stand up and say, hey, I've got a word too, John. All right, preach it, brother. Preach it, sister. And they'd start preaching. And then they'd just go and go and go. And we have documents that talked about that they would go all day long. Why is it that they could go all day long, but if we ain't out by 12, we're griping? The Baptist denomination is built on the backs of giants of the faith. But in 1619, something happened. The first controversy in the Baptist church. Guess what it was about? Music. Can you believe Baptists were arguing about music? <laughs> oh my goodness. Didn't see that coming. That was sarcasm in case you didn't catch it. <laughs> the pastors would sing to the congregation. The congregation couldn't sing to Jesus. And so the pastors wanted to hang control of that. And so this big debate happened about, well, is choral singing, is that permissible in the church? Look at it. It's right there in the front pages of your Baptist hymn if you don't believe me. In 1619, 400 years ago, our forefathers in the Baptist denomination, they got something wrong. It's not about their preference. It's about praise. Preference is about you. Preference is about you. My preference is about me. Praise is all about who? Jesus. Man, that's a humbling word, isn't it? It's a word that I suffer from when my preference gets in the way of my praise. But here's the problem, though. A lot of the times, you and I, our preference gets in the way of praise of somebody else, and that's unexcusable. Jesus told his disciples to let the little children come to him. Let me put that in context for you, okay? When you become a Christian, your life starts over. Jesus takes what was dead and makes it new. That is your first, that's like your real birth right there. And let me tell you something about youth ministry. You want to gripe about how youth act? They act a whole lot better than some of the people who have been saved for a long time, and they're just babies. I love ministering to teenagers. I love ministering to teenagers because I've got the passion and the enthusiasm that you see all throughout the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here is where we 
we come to a crossroads. There are babies in the faith. Your job as a mature Christian is to make sure that you concede your preference so that way they can comfortably praise. Better yet, let's talk about the people who are just dead. We just talked about the babies in Christ. Let's talk about the people who are just dead. Your job as a mature Christian is to concede your preference so that way they can experience praise comfortably. Well, Kobe, you're just saying that on your own opinion. Uh, let's look at what Scripture has to say about that. Where did Jesus go and meet all the dead people? He went to their homes. He went to where they were. Jesus never asked them, Hey, dead man, dead woman, come to the temple. Your house is just a little bit too dirty for me. Why did he go to their homes? Of all the places to meet, why did he go into the homes of these sinners, to the prostitutes, the tax collectors? Why did he do such a thing? Could it be because in their home was the place that they were the most comfortable? And could it be that Jesus knows that when Satan is about to lose dominion over an individual, he is going to attack in every way possible? It is our job as the church to make sure we take the platform out from under Satan and say, hey, you can't attack this person because we're going to make it comfortable comfortable for them to engage Jesus Christ. Preference versus praise. If it's your preference that is dominating your praise, it's not praise at all. When Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 17. Flip over just one or two pages right there. This is a good passage right here. Woo. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white. They were sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus, check this out, had been lying, past tense. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Because, isn't it true? I mean, she would only weep if there was a reason to weep. But she didn't have one. She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, Check this out. I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. What do we get from this passage right here? When Jesus beat death, when he left death, he left behind victory. When Jesus left death, he left behind victory. Hey, y'all. That last little sentence right there where it says, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God, your God. What he's trying to tell the disciples right there is this right here. If, if we could translate it in modern day English. You guys have been hiding in the shadows for too long now. I won. Satan doesn't have no control over me, over you, or over this world anymore. He says, I ascend, I'm going to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. In the Olympics, when somebody wins the gold medal, they ascend to the highest platform. When Jesus is saying, I ascend, he is ascending to the highest platform. His is the victory. And because his is the victory and he paid your debt, guess who gets to share in that victory with him? We do. There's two things that you need to see from here. Number one is this right here. There are some of you that are in the room and listen, huge, sorry, huge, huge vice of mine, huge, huge sin of mine of not being able to accept the grace that God wants to give me. I've told y'all before, I think that most people, they look at Jesus one of two ways, either as the lion who's all about justice and all about the, the attack and then the lamb who's all about mercy and grace. Listen, if you only look at Jesus as the lamb, then you're never going to see him as the lion who is about justice. If you only look at him as the lion, then you're never going to see him as the lamb. You've got to meet somewhere in the middle where Jesus is holy. Victory. Some of us in this room, we need to embrace the victory that Jesus Christ has already won for us. 
Some of us in this room have shame and guilt that we're walking around with, and the best thing you can do today is go up to somebody. There's something, it's not that like anybody you talk to is going to remove the sin from you, but there's something so freeing about telling somebody else, maybe that's why Jesus tells us to confess our sins to one another, that when you go to them and say, I have had this in my life, I'm done with it. Jesus paid my price, he is the victory, and now I can sit here and tell you that Satan doesn't have a foothold in my life anymore. Some of you need to do that today. Some of us husbands, we need to go tell our wives some things that's going to be really, really tough. But you're not bound by defeat. You are loosed in victory. Some of us, we need to go tell our children things. Some of you children need to go tell your parents things. What will you leave behind? I hope it is the victory of Jesus Christ. And that everywhere you go, people will see that. The other place that we take this from this, this victory stance is that you and I will face battles nearly every minute of every day. You might have just faced a battle right there. Your preference got in the way of your praise because the song wasn't exactly how you liked it or how you remembered and you had to enter into a battle. Am I going to give Jesus Christ the praise that he's due? I, have to, I go through it. If you say you don't, there's your struggle. If God has already won the major victory, the war, and has given us the freedom to fight battles, but he's also given us the Holy Spirit to fight for us, then let us leave behind victory after victory after victory after victory, and so on and so forth until we get to experience the ultimate victory as we enter into the throne room of heaven. Can we get down with that? Acts chapter 1. So don't forget, when Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. When he left death, he left behind victory. In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, it says this right here. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking in the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind. Listen now, I just read a bunch of names to you. And look at verse 14 real close. It says, These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. When Jesus left earth, he left behind disciples. When Jesus left earth, he left behind disciples. Just listed 11 of them. We got an idea of what their life looked like. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer together in the upper room. If you were to continue reading in Acts chapter 1, we just don't have enough time today, or maybe we should just go ahead and do it to give Jesus a little bit more praise. If you continue reading, guys, you see that Peter stands up and he gives this sermon, and the day of Pentecost comes and 3,000 people get saved. What do disciples do? They make disciples. What did Jesus do? He made disciples. What are we supposed to do? Make disciples. It is so difficult. It is so difficult to separate evangelism from discipleship because I hear churches oftentimes, and quite frankly, I just want to laugh at them because they're like, well, we're not so much focused on evangelism and missions as we are discipleship. Hey, Matthew chapter 28, what does he say? Go therefore and make disciples. Do you not think evangelism is incorporated into that? For you as an individual... You call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who are you discipling? What do I mean by that? How do you do that? It's, it's incredibly simple. You get into the trenches of life with someone or a group of people. Jesus had 12 that he made into disciples. One of them fell away. They ended up getting him replaced so we can still say 12, but he specifically poured into three of them. Specifically poured into three of them. James, John, and Peter. Who was with him whenever he was transfigured? James, John, and Peter. 
Who is constantly mentioned throughout Scripture? James, John, and Peter. Find three people. Find 12 if you're feeling ambitious. That would be great. You ain't going to see me argue. Find three people and you get into the trenches of life with them. In their good days, you stand in the trenches of life with them. In their bad days, you stand in the trenches of life with them. Listen, one of the greatest faults of the church nowadays is that you see in Scripture that Jesus says that He came to heal the sick. But when a sick person enters into that door right there, we act like they got leprosy and we go the other direction. Can you believe that addiction that man has? Can you believe what that woman is doing behind closed doors? Can you believe all this sin that they have compiled against themselves when you don't even see the sin that is blocking your own vision? When we see sick people, we flock to them because that's exactly what Jesus did. Disciples make disciples and they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. There's going to be people that you're called to they don't have a lot of money in their pocket. You know what? That's awesome because you might. And if you want to go and play that game of, well, they need to pay for themselves. They need to have some skin in the game. I don't agree with you and I think you're wrong. I think it's unbiblical because you have money in your pocket for a reason and guess what? It doesn't belong to you anyways. Are you being a blessing to somebody else? There's going to be people that have holes in their shirt. There's going to be people that are dirty. There's going to be people that are sick, spiritually and physically. Are you willing to get into the trenches of life with them no matter how they come? Are you willing as a church, Central Baptist, to say to Jesus, yes? Because what if... What if Jesus looks into our church and says, Jacksonville is a diverse place. You need more diversity. So what I want you to do is go plant a church in a house in Lincoln Park. I want you to go and plant a church in a house over by Lawn Morris. I want you to go and plant a church in a house in University Hills. Would we be willing to say, yes, Jesus? Because I can tell you this right here, when it came down to all the dirty, rotten scoundrels that Jesus came in contact with, he had one thing in mind. I'm going to go make disciples. However I got to do it, I'm going to do it. If it's from allowing some woman to come up and touch my cloth without me knowing, that's how I'm going to do it. If it's about telling some little bitty guy up in a fig tree, get down, let's go eat, I'm going to do it. That's the life. That's the example of Jesus. If Jesus left earth and left behind disciples, you can be sure that when you leave earth, you will be accountable for how many disciples you left behind. Let it not be few. Let it be right. Let it be righteous. When Jesus left life, he left behind sacrifice. When Jesus left death, he left behind victory. And when Jesus left earth, he left behind disciples. Central Baptist, that's our calling card this morning. So y'all pray with me that this would happen. Pray earnestly with me that this would happen. Y'all bow.